welcome to the Business Greater Than You podcast, where we dive deep into the stories of men and women who have successfully transcended the frazzled solopreneur life and built productive teams with better lifestyle and income. I'm Nelson Bars, the founder and owner of Utah Independent Mortgage Corp. And I'm Liz Sears, founder and co-owner of My Utah Agents. We're excited for you to listen, interact, and grow with us. So please share your comments below and let's get started. Okay, today we have an exciting episode. I'm, I've, we've been waiting over a month to get Kyle in here. Kyle Corridge, the owner of Bond Agency Insurance and a good friend of mine. And I just uh, have been eager to pick your brain, Kyle, about your business. Well, I've been waiting a month for the invitation. <laughs> no, <I'm serious. laughs> so thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank for you. being willing to let us. I know you're, you're a little reluctant to come and talk about your business, but I've been so impressed with so many aspects of your business. Um, so. Your business is an insurance agency started in Wyoming. Correct. You expanded into multiple states. You have an office here in Utah. You moved to Utah to bring your business here, right? Yes, that's right. Tell us a little bit more about your company and. So the the, the long story is, so I am the uh, fourth owner of the line of this company. We've been around for about 126 years. Oh, so um, for like a uh, little just a little bit, bit right? So we are actually technically the oldest independent agency now in the state of Wyoming. Um, because of some other buyouts and closures, but uh, the name Bond Agency comes from the original proprietor. Cecil Bond started the company back in 1895, and so it still bears his name just because of branding and other issues there, but um, it's, it's been kind of a family business for most of that time period. Uh, my wife's grandfather took it over from the original proprietor, and then my father-in-law, and then I bought it. I started buying it from my father-in-law back in 2006. Um, and then we have finalized that buyout completely a few years ago. So. And before you started the buyout, you were working in the business for how long? Yeah, so I started working in the insurance industry kind of fresh um, as a fresh off an LDS mission. I was a, a college student at BYU um, and got into some financial stuff. Um, started working for my father, well, my future father-in-law. It wasn't my father-in-law at the time. Uh, just as a salesperson, as a starting to sell the insurance, doing the home and auto stuff, right? And um, I didn't, oh, well, I have to interrupt. Yes. So did you meet him through your soon-to-be wife at the time, or did you meet her through getting the no, job? I've known, I've known him for my whole life. His, um, <laughs> my, my parents uh, and, his, and him and my, my wife's parents have been good friends for my whole life. So we've known them. That's why he invited me to come work for him. He was having some health issues, needed someone to, he trusted to kind of care and come look after the business. And so I started there um, in that process and then eventually married his daughter. So it worked out really good. Yeah. For me especially, so. Yeah, two perks. <laughs> but I started just doing sales, right? And, and uh, home and auto, um, it's a little monotonous. Um, I didn't really care for it that much, but I was really good at it. I was good with people, um, good with sales, uh, understood the concept of what I was selling very well. Um, and then I started selling commercial insurance a couple years later. And I started selling to businesses and corporations and, and big and small. And that's when I fell in love with the insurance world because I got to meet uh, people who are building important things and doing things that are important. Um, and a lot like our listener base. Yes, a lot like your <laughs> listener base, right? And and it was fun for me because I got to go in and see what they were doing, how they were doing it, and what their risk assessment was and be able to protect them and their company. And so I loved getting to rub shoulders with those individuals. It was very exciting and powerful for me. And that's when I fell in love with it. So shortly thereafter, I um, approached um, the owner, my father-in-law, and told him I either wanted to buy the company or... I uh, would like to step off on my own. And of course, then we made an agreement to start buying the company at that point. But he was too young to retire. So he stayed on for many, many more years, about 14 more years um, as I started that buyout process. And now he has since retired uh, just a few years ago and, and we finalized his, his buyout completely. But so that's kind of the start of how I got into the business originally. And, um, and when you got into it, there was one location, right? One location, yeah, Casper, Wyoming. It was located and, and we served the state and uh, we did a really good job of servicing that state. Uh, you know, we didn't have computers. We had paper files when I started. <laughs> uh, we didn't have any of that stuff. So, yeah, it was just that one location. And how has the business changed since you started the buyout? So, a lot has changed um, in the years that I started the buyout back in 2006. We have since implemented computer systems. Uh, we do everything electronically now so we can, you know, I'm, we would, a client would walk into our office, we would go to a filing cabinet and pull a file out, literally, so we could see their portfolio of their policy information. Well, that has obviously long since gone away and everything's done on computer systems. But growth wise, um, we have really expanded. So outside of just Wyoming, we now service 
uh, many states in the Mountain West area. Um, I think we're at 18 states now. We just added. Oh my gosh. We added one more about two weeks ago, um, and so we we're continually growing. But because we, most of your business, you're able to do just like on Zoom and phone calls and correct, things. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so we can serve as long as we're licensed, we can service that. We give them the service they need wherever it may be, right? And so phone because the technology, yeah. phones and. Uh, Zoom meeting type conference, face-to-face -face conferences, we can do that anywhere we, we want. It's really nice. Um, in that process since 2006, we've done multiple acquisitions of uh, competing agencies, you could say, that would do the same type of thing that we do, that were either looking to uh, retire or to change their business. And so we went in and assimilated and bought them in and brought them into the bond agency fold and the family. So we've done four of those in the last 10 years. Um, and so it's really helped us grow. But that's also allowed us to uh, open up the office here in Utah that we have as well. And you moved here to Utah as after you opened the office, right? After. So yeah, it was, it was kind of an interesting thing. So we, um, I bought one of my longtime associates out in, in 2011 is when it was. Um, he had a great insurance office here in northern Utah. And he was getting ready to retire. I'd known him for many years. Um, and so he approached and said, I want to retire. And so we bought his business from him. Um, but since he had a good presence in Utah, we decided instead of just running it from our Wyoming office to actually open a physical location here in the state of Utah. And so it would be our second physical location. Um, and at that time, um, we, we didn't have any employees here because it was just him and his daughter that were working in the office and she didn't want to stick on. And so I was driving back and forth to Utah and Wyoming uh, two weeks at a time. I'd spend two weeks in Utah, I'd be two weeks in Wyoming. Two weeks, I, I got a lot of reading, done, well, reading, you know, audiobooks done during that time. <laughs> so I learned a lot. But um, so we had just those, those two offices. But um, so we, we did get a team together. It took a little bit of time, but we got a team put together for our Utah office, and it worked out really well. Two years after that acquisition in 2013, um, we, my wife and I were here doing some family stuff. Some of my family lived in the state of Utah at the time, so we were at a family reunion here. And uh, we just kind of felt this pull and this need to be here. And we sold our house in Wyoming and had a house under contract um, within just a matter of 24 to 48 hours here in oh Utah. Oh my gosh, quick and So we moved here in 2013 um, and have decided to keep growing the business from here and it's worked out really well for us so far. Yeah, that's great. And you still go back to Wyoming quite often? Quite often, yes. Yeah. So I go back um, about every six to eight weeks, I'm back there for about a week at a time, sometimes more often, sometimes less. Um, it's easy for me to drive out there during the summer. The winter months, I don't get out as much because <laughs> the weather in Casper is not as good as here. But um, yeah, I, I spend a lot of time out there. And of course, I'm face to face with them every day with our technology anyway. So. Nice. Well, talk to us a little bit about how you um, started growing the team here, like how you put it together. What were some of the wins that worked out nicely and some of the struggles that you had to work through? Yeah. So, and here's, here's the thing with putting the team together is that I found is you're never going to get it right every time. Um, sometimes you hit the jackpot and sometimes you, you miss that jackpot. You swing and a miss, you know, big time. And um, I'll tell you, the first hire we had was a jackpot. Yeah. Um, we were looking for a manager type personnel, knowing that I couldn't be here physically every day, uh, traveling back and forth from Wyoming. Uh, we interviewed lots of people, found some really good individuals. And I never was really settled. And I'm actually a little ashamed to say that uh, my father-in-law is the one who approached me at the time because he was still in the business. and. He said, well, what about your really good friend from high school, uh, Brian? And he said, what about him? Is, what's he up to? And I'm a little ashamed that I didn't come up with the idea. Uh, but anyway, I called Brian. He was managing uh, Chase Bank at the time in a different state. I called him up and see if he was interested in it. And um, he quit his job and moved up here in 10 days. Oh, wow. That was fast. And he, he still to this day is with the company. And he runs our Utah operation perfectly and seamlessly and he's in charge there. So that was a jackpot hit, right? I, I wish I had come up with that idea, but it was a natural fit because we had, Brian and I have known each other since first grade, worked together and, and, and that stuff. So that's a really good one, but. So a question for you before we move on yeah. from that, is that your father-in-law bringing it up and you saying, ah, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. Like what were some of the traits, the personality traits that um, looking back, you're like, yeah, that would have been exactly what I need to watch for because a lot of our listeners here, um, sometimes they're looking to hire somebody. So what, like, what are some of the specific pieces that could be a trigger for them? Yeah, so you know, I think all those traits that you're looking for, um, everyone w wants to hit these really good traits, you know, the integrity, the honesty, the longevity, the loyalty, right? Um, I think the loyalty is the biggest one. You, you know, he had been, you see that he had been 
with the Washington Mutual companies for many, many years, and they eventually got out, bought out by Chase, so that's why he was with Chase at the time. Uh, but he had worked his way up and was managing um, a branch um, and de dedicated that service to them. So I think that loyalty is really a big factor there. There's some familiarity, which you're not always going to have a familiarity with uh, new hires. We had a very close familiarity because we'd known each other for 30 years. Um, not everyone's going to have that, but um, that really hard work and dedicatory spirit that they bring with them to do that, that's probably the biggest thing that really is that, that there to know that you're not bouncing around from job to job all the time, I think is a critical piece. You know, what else stands out to me though is you're hit, you went for a leader first, right? Yeah. You were looking for someone to run your Utah operation, someone with management experience, and I think that's almost the exact opposite of what most people visualize, right? It's like, well, I'm going to get a a really cheap assistant, maybe an intern or you know a, a VA or some virtual yeah, assistant. Yeah, you're I can, right. I can go cheap, and that's the ten times less likely to work out than if you, someone who you're looking for who comes in with that experience. That's that's a good point. And so I think part of the reason that I was wanting to hit that high level individual first is be is because I wasn't going to be there full time. I was still traveling. I didn't live in Utah full time yet, and so I needed to have that high level person. But looking back, you hit it right on the head. Is that's why it's been so successful is because we hit that high level person first yeah. instead of trying to build up to that and start off on the lower entry level person first. Hitting that high level job I think was critical to the success of that operation. And, and was he the one then that was interviewing and hiring and building yep. out? So he helped through that process and I, I ultimately had this final say and he would, he would kind of filter him through to me and we would do some of that but he ultimately was, was involved in that process very heavily as well. And he had been doing it in previous positions anyway so he was familiar with that process. I think it's so um, interesting and amazing and awesome when you hit that level where you're opening another location or you're opening another division of your business where the person that you put into that position is the one who does all the hiring for you. Yeah. So just finally reaching that level myself and, it, and it's different. It's interesting to... It's nerve wracking though because yeah. for me, I'm a, control, I'm a control freak, right? And I have that death grip on some of those things. Yeah. It's hard for me to let go of those. Uh, but when you find a person like Brian, who I have in place, it, it makes it, it gives you that breath of fresh air. You can it, it's easy to let go of that a little bit, right? So hiring the right person helps. Hiring the right transition. person is so critical. It, let, it lets you loosen up that death grip just a little bit, and you're, uh, you're able to let go. I'm glad you said that. I, I've I thought for a long time I just was a terrible delegator until I hired the right person. Right? Mm -hmm. I went through three or four or five of the wrong person that I could never trust and never did. Or and, when you did trust them, it came back to bite right. you. Right. Yeah. And and the lack of trust, they could sense it. They didn't enjoy it either, right? Right. And it just the night and day when, when there was finally a person that I could trust and they felt that and they took the trust and ran with it and built upon it. And they built it and they, and they, they feel like they succeeded then too, right? Because they have built, they have your trust and they have that and they, they feel like they have really grown into that position on their own. And so it's, it's really a, a benefit both ways, a win-win. So that was a win. Yes, that right? was a win. Do you have, have some other stories? We had a couple swinging uh, misses in between after him, right? And we had a couple that didn't work out so good that, that maybe they were good and, and, and um, just maybe not the right fit of job because this is, job isn't for everyone. But um, we had a couple big strikeouts. And we had a couple really good ones and just ended up you know, getting married and moving away out of state and something didn't work out. But then another really good critical hire, honestly, come... Our, our, a lot of our really, really good hires that we've had have come from people we know and trust and have those the relationships referrals. with that we really yeah. refer people to us. Um, funny enough, so one of our other key critical employees in my Utah office is a daughter of a client of my Wyoming office. Really? And so she called and said, hey, are you by chance hiring in your Utah office? My daughter's looking for a job. And because of the relationship I had with her and her husband, um, I said, yeah, and so we, we brought her in and hired her, and she's been with us for about nine years now in our, in our Utah office, and it's just so critical to the operation. It's been really, really good hire. Um, but again, it came from another familiarity, right? And so yeah. it's just they a big piece. Word of mouth is almost more powerful than all of the great online employment sites. Yeah. A uh, question for you on the swing and a miss people. So <laughs> yes. on some of those, what were some of the lessons learned that um, in hindsight, now, if you find yourself in a similar situation and if you could give the, you know, terrible, awful details, so that way, you know, we can learn from it too, that would be fantastic. Well, I think the biggest thing that I've learned in those mistakes is when you, as soon as you know what's wrong, make a change. Mm -hmm. um, I have, in many occasions, because you, you want to be the nice guy. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. 
you, you know, whatever it may be, you hold on to them too long. And I think if I've learned anything, and I have tried to implement, even in, in sometimes when we still make the mistakes, is when you figure out that it's wrong, don't wait to make the change. Get rid of them. They're going to be grateful for it because if you're not happy, most, most likely the chances are they're not happy with what's going on either. Right. And they're, they're frustrated. They're unhappy with whatever may be going on. And so when you figure that out, um, it's easier just to make the change sooner rather than later. And that's probably my biggest thing I've learned. It's hard because you don't want to be the bad guy, you know, but I think it's... Well, and you want to the coach best. them up and you want to help. And I've been through that too. It's, it's always... I mean, I have yet to see where there was somebody that was kind of heading down the wrong path that I was able to somehow miraculously turn around right. or change the relationship. It, it always ended bad. And, and the fact that I tried so hard made it worse. Right. Right. And some people are a natural fit for the job. And some the people who don't work out, they're a natural fit for another job. And so by letting them move on to something else, you're truly benefiting them just as much as you're benefiting your company by making that change soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, we have one right now that... Um, the conversation actually was that we really did realize the job description we had given her um, was not in alignment with her strengths. It was like in alignment with somewhere she really struggles. And um, as we had her doing that job, we realized, oh my gosh, this is not working the way we wanted it to. And so how to have that conversation to say, look, we want to transition your job description, not because you suck at this, but because well, you do, but <laughs> but it's also because exactly. your strength is here and you're not enjoying your job. We're not getting our money's worth. And it was funny because I did use that term and it kind of hurt her feelings. But later when we were talking about it, I'm like, when you can have that empowerment feeling of you don't have to be good at everything and it's fine that that's not your strength. Let's maximize where your strength is because sometimes yeah. that's what we need. Have and you if, ever had that? Well, if you have an organization large enough where you, when you, where you, find someone whose strengths aren't right in the position they have and you can transition them into a position that is their strength, that's really, really amazing. And, and sometimes not every organization is going to have that opportunity to transition into a or different even department. even there's just right? not an opening. Or there's yeah. not an opening, right, or something. But, but if you have that ability and you recognize their strength and you need it in your company somewhere, that's a great ability to have to do that. Yep. Recognizing that is, is huge. I think though as, as a boss, if you want to say, or an entrepreneur or a business owner, being able to recognize their strengths and being able to, to tap into those is critical, I think, in, in having your organization be successful. Yep, exactly. Well, I have, uh, for a long time, I've really admired your work-life balance. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you here. Okay. I know your, your family, you have a wonderful family, and you, you have a wonderful business as well, and they don't rob each other, right? I've, I've seen how you um, yeah, he talks about how he sees you going on vacations, going on family trips, travel, all that. He's like, wait, I'll call I want you that. on like a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I'm just drowning, and he's like, yeah, I'm on the way home for the week, you know. I'm boating. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm good. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, and I just, I'd love to just get into the nuts and bolts of of how your operation runs, and and if I could use an analogy, this comes from a book I read, Clockwork Business by Mike McCulloch. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. He talks about the difference between a player on the field a coach on the sideline, and an owner in the owner's box, right? And I feel like um, you may be one of our guests who's more living the life of a business owner, and you have coaches, and you have players, but I'd love to just hear the organization. How does it work, and, and what, it, what, what advice do you have for someone who struggles with work-life balance? Yeah, so this is, so the people, when they start a business, we got to start off from the beginning, I think, is they, they start a business, they want to do business because of the benefits it brings eventually. And I think they forget that eventually sometime, right? And so there's a lot of work that goes into getting to the point where even I'm at. I don't think I've made it all the way for sure because I, I still put a lot of work in, but um, I definitely have the ability to take some of those leisures that business owners enjoy. Um, but it, it doesn't start off that way immediately. Um, so I have a great team. I have 15 employees that work underneath, um, underneath me in some way, shape, or form. And because we take the time and uh, opportunity to make sure we hire the right people at the right time, um, and they are very good at what they do, it frees up so much of my time and my ability. They're a lot better at their job than I am at their job. I can't do what they do. I don't want to do what they do. That's why they're doing it. And so I have the opportunity to watch them succeed and grow and do their things. But by them being so good at what they're doing, it does free up so much of my time to to be outside looking in and kind of running the business, uh, like you said, maybe up in the owner's box a little bit, right? And so, 
the work-life balance is nice. So I do enjoy to travel. That's probably one of my favorite things in life to do is to, to see different places in, in the country and different places in the world, but allow my kids to enjoy those experiences as well. And so there are opportunities that we do take on occasion uh, to leave the office, um, leave and go uh, places for three, four, five days at a time. Um, and do I stay connected to the office along the way? Of course. I mean, as a business owner, it's hard to really completely disconnect. But instead of being right in their face in, in my employee's you know, background for eight to 10 hours a day, I'm, I'm on the phone with them or an email 30 minutes a day while I'm away. And so I'm able to do that because they know that I trust them to do their job. They know that they're better at the job than I am anyway. And so they, they know what their duties and responsibilities are to do that. Um, so part of it, like you just said, is getting to the point where the job description that you expect them to do has been very thoroughly documented, it's been very thoroughly trained, and then now you're supervising to make sure that it happens. Yeah, and so that does start at the very beginning. So we have a, an employee manual that we have that they've got to understand, and we have a procedure manual that helps them identify their job duties and responsibilities for that particular position. Um, and sometimes it's even a shared position because we have three people doing the exact same thing. Right? Which is and nice because so then when one's gone, the other's covered. The other can do it, right? Yep. And so they all have a, a very clear and good understanding of that. But then having it documented, you mentioned the word documented, um, so that it's clear, so they have a reference to go back to. If they're not sure what to be done, they don't have to come to me every single time. Like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do this? It's a written document of procedure that they can refer back to. And so, that so is it in a physical book or how do you have that it done? Is a, well, we do print it. But it is a digital format. We have it online in our on our shared file on, on our uh, computer system. But it is printed. They, most of them keep it in a drawer in the desk and pull it out and refer to it. Some people pull it up right on, on their PDF on their computer to refer to it when they need to. But having that is really helpful to them because they know what their duties and responsibilities are. And if we add and take away sometimes their duties, but not just knowing their duties, but how to do their duties too, and so that they're, they're performing it efficiently and well. So tell us some of the roles, some of the different jobs in your office. What are the different? Yes, yeah, so we, we have two full departments. So we have a, what's called the personal lines division. They handle you know, the home and auto, the boats, and, that, and all the toys. Um, that's what they handle. Um, they intake that they, from beginning all the way through to the end and, and then continue to service it throughout time. We have a commercial lines division, which is all your, your business owners, which are kind of your audience today, right? It's what they handle all the servicing of the commercial um, insurances that there are. So in each division, they kind of have a lot of the same um, levels of uh, people. So we have customer service reps. They handle the incoming phone calls. They handle some of the, the smaller service needs that they may have. Then we have account executives that kind of a little bit higher where they're um, really dealing face to face with the intricate details of their policies, servicing them, what's covered, what's not, maybe making some of the important visits to and from the office and with those individuals. They're kind of the face of my company with that client. So client A, they know that they have a signed account executive um, and they know that if, instead of reaching me and contacting me, they work directly with that account executive to handle all their business needs. And sometimes that account executive will hand it off to one of the CSRs for, for one of those things too to handle some of that processing. Um, and then you have producers like myself who actually bring in the business, who help sell and, and bring those in. Um, and they're kind of um, the initial um, salesman, if you will, to bring the business in and kind of help the marketing of the, of the company. So those are kind of the, the levels of individuals we have, and they, they each kind of work harmoniously with each other to make sure that it all is handled um, seamlessly in each of their divisions, the commercial and personalized departments. So your producers, the salespeople, do they have assistance in teams, or is it really, do the teams not step in until after the deal's done? Yeah, so they, they don't really step in until after the deal's done. So they'll sell the business. Um, they may have some help in the office getting those, those quotes and the policies and everything put together. Um, but once that business is sold and brought into the office, it's handed off to one of those account executives. They help service it from there so that the salesman producer can go out and continue to work on other new business. Okay. Yeah. So it's a very clean handoff. Very clean handoff, yeah. And is that salesman still involved? Sure, but not on the day-to-day -day operations that the account executives are. Their, their job is to bring in the new business. And the account executives and CSRs is to maintain that and service that business that they're bringing in. So how, give an example of how the conversation looks to a client for that handoff. Yeah, so it's simple. Um, as they sell the business, they say, hey, I'm, so you have a point of contact day to day, so you know who you're gonna deal with. Um, I am going to hand you off to account executive A. And they, they um, we have a name, we have a picture, 
You know, sometimes we even have a, a video now to do some marketing companies that we work with that we can email them that for, an e for a video introduction. So they have a face, a name, a little bit of personal info about that account executive that that salesperson is handing them off to uh, so they know who they're dealing with and it has all their contact information right there. Um, so it's done a lot of it virtually, of course, um, and they, they make that handoff virtually. And then that account executive then reaches out to them proactively and sees what they need from there on. And so uh, that person, that client, knows from day one who they're supposed to deal with. There's no ambiguity. Um, it makes it a little bit easier for them to, to know and contact directly who they need. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I think if I, if I think about my own life and what took me so long to actually build a team, it was fear of that handoff, right? It was like, okay, I don't want someone to feel cheated because I'm the one that sold them and now they get someone else. Right. Yeah. So I, I have that same fear even still to this day. Right. Um, but by putting the right people in place, it, it does make it a little bit easier. But I think as a business owner um, and as a salesperson, as a leader, you're always going to want to have that connection with that person that you dealt with initially. Right. Uh, but knowing that you, by having the right people in place, um, it makes it easier because I know that my team is going to service them faster, more efficiently and way better than I can. Now, there might be some coverage questions and some things that come up that they come back to me with, but overall, the, uh, the connection with that person is so much easier with my team than it is with me. Well, and what I've found now is that if I have a team who's handling well all the, all of the hard parts, when I make a contact with the client, it's more of a relationship call, right? It's, it's how is my team yes. doing? How are we taking care of you? What else can I help you with? It's, it's a different kind of call. It's still a relationship, but I would never have had that call if I was buried in the weeds of, of Doing a loan the process job. Yeah. Right. or whatever. And so that's, that's what I do like is because I get to manage those relationships a little bit differently than my, than my team does. I get to reach out and say, hey, I'm just checking in, want to see if you've made any changes, how are things going, instead of like, oh, there's a problem, let me reach out to you. I leave that to maybe some of them in, uh, on some of those. Why but, haven't you signed this page? Right, <laughs> like, yeah, why, yeah why, I'm still waiting for this. Like, why haven't I got it? Like, my team can take care of that. So I get to do a little bit more of the building and maintaining the relationship on a good friendly basis because um, as most businesses it's about relationships um, and, that, and I can't contact every single person every single day uh, but having a team to be able to handle that stuff really makes a big difference. All right, so next question I have for you, Kyle, is I know that your company has a significantly lower turnover than a lot of insurance companies I know and so I'd love for you to share with us what are some of your ways that you do that. Yeah, so that's, impo that's important to us, um, really is important. Our team members, we actually call them family members. Um, we are a family-owned business, and we have been, and we maintain the family status even inside the walls of our office. Um, we treat them as family. And so we try to create that atmosphere even during work hours where people can feel comfortable broaching any subject. Um, they come into my office, closed door, and they, they can feel comfortable knowing that whatever we talked about can be private in there. But we also create an atmosphere where we feel there our employees are our best asset we have as a company. And so we feel by taking care of them, they you will kind of in set turn, the example of yeah, taking care of. They'll take care back of us and also turn that around and take care of our clients um, as family because we want to create that atmosphere. And so we try to create a benefit structure for them to feel like they can stay and make a career out of working for our agency. Um, a lot of agencies. Was that in place when you bought the business? Um, mostly, yes, it was. And I think, I, I think I've inherited that desire because of um, buying it from the, the previous owner, his desire to make it, a, make it that way. And so most everything was in place that way and has been really ingrained in me as I've grown in the business. I've seen how that's benefited our business. <laughs> no pun intended there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it really has benefited our business atmosphere, right? And so we make sure that they have their emotional, their, especially their financial needs met um, because it's important. We want them to be taken care of. We want them to feel like they can be um, part there for a long time. We want them to be alone because it's expensive to get someone in. It's expensive to get them trained and to, and to risk the wrong hire. <laughs> to risk the wrong hire. And so when you get the right ones, you want to make sure that they are there for a long time because that it takes in, in, our, in our business, when you get someone brand new who doesn't have the training and licensing, it takes them six to 12 months to really be a profitable employee. Right. And so you're spending a lot of time and energy and money to get them to be profitable. So what are some of the culture building things that you do that help have that feeling? Um, so we, well, we, we do have, it's family atmosphere. So we, 
we have we find every occasion we can to have food at the office, right? And so, yeah. uh, but we all participate now. Everyone gets to bring stuff, and we have it in the break room, and we all kind of take a break and we potluck type. We thing. go potluck type things on a regular occasion. Um, we celebrate family occasions, whether it's uh, a birth or a wedding or a baptism, whatever it may be in any of our employees, we celebrate together as an office. And it's even during office hours, we participate in those things. And so um, we we find it very opportunistic that we get to celebrate these things. And we all know the, the names of their kids and, you know, their boyfriends or girlfriends, you know, we, we get to know those individuals and they're, they're like that uh, family uh, with us. And so. Do you ever have dog day at the office? No, but that's a good thought. I just popped dog in my day. head. I'm yeah. like, I've never Sounds done that crazy. either. Yeah. I mean, our, we've Hot had dog like. Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dog day. Yeah. So. Well, we've had a couple impromptus where people will bring their dogs to the office and it turns into a, like a party, but not on a regular. Actually, yeah. we've, plan. we've had a couple of dogs visit too. It really does we've, brighten up. We've had a yeah. couple of dogs, but I've never had a dog day, but that might be fun to do because we all you know, have our dogs yeah. and have those things. But uh, we do feel like it's really nice because uh, people feel very comfortable when they need to take some time for family things they aren't hesitant to make sure they, they ask for those things. They feel like their family is protected in our office. They know that family is number one. They know that family comes first. And we, we know that we have a business to run. We know that we have to run a business. And we have to take care of those things. But family is always first. And that includes our employees' families. Their families are always first. You know, the word that comes to mind with all that is commitment. I, I remember talking to a business owner who was so frustrated because of turnover. and. So he, he had an employee that left because, oh, this other company offered full time, 40 hours a week and benefits. And he said, we'll never have that for our employees. And it happens to be in the same industry as you, right? And I remember thinking, if you want them to be committed to you, you have to be committed to them as well, right? Yeah. And what do you say? I mean, I think the struggle, knowing, knowing his business and many businesses, is the cost. Like, what does it really cost to provide that level of commitment to your to your employees um a lot so our our benefit package is far exceeds any of our expenses in our office um when when you mentioned that benefits offices my size and in my industry don't normally offer the benefits that we do we're one of the very few of the insurance brokerages our size that offer full benefits so we we pay 100 percent of our employees health insurance we have a retirement plan that is 100% employer contribution. It's not a match. We contribute 100% uh, of their retirement. And it's a profit sharing plan. So some years it's 7%, some years it's 13%. But we've never been lower than 5%. And usually people 5% are 5% of their annual salary? Of their annual salary. Wow. And usually employers are doing a 3 to 5% match um, if they participate. Well, it's hard to participate sometimes in those. And so we want to make sure that they're taken care of. So we give 100% of the contribution, um, and depending on what that level is, but we've never been under 5%. And we pay 100% of their health insurance. Which is big. I mean, I, we do health insurance in our office, and it, it is a huge expense. And it is. We do not pay 100%. I can't imagine it would. So it's, it's an office our size. I mean, it's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year between the, all the benefits. Um, but do you want your employees to stick around? Is it, is it easier for me to have an employee where I spend a little bit extra time and money on every single month or over the years, and I have them stick around for seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, or to have a turnover where every 18 months I'm trying to get someone new and the hassle of training. And, um, does it cost us money? Absolutely. But it, it makes it so much easier in the long run for them and for us because they feel like they're taken care of and they, they are dedicated to the business just as much as we're trying to dedicate to them. That's amazing. I feel like I haven't grown up yet because we don't really have a benefits package. And Nelson was telling me about, you know, kind of the starting one with the dental vision, you know, life insurance, things like that. Uh, and then also medical, whether, you know, you give them a stipend that they can use towards whatever or offering like, so you have um, in your own um, company, you have the medical like group plan, basically. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So we provide it and it's a group plan for all of our employees that they participate in. Group plans are not, I mean, I have a very small team. I think we, we did our group plan when we had less than 10 people, right? It's not, it's really not impossible to get it if you want to offer it. And you don't have to start by paying a hundred percent, but I think that, you know, the key I keep thinking of is your, your assistant who's nine years with you, right? Yeah. Can you imagine how much easier your life would be if you had someone 
who's nine years in and knew that much about your business, about your mm -hmm. your clients and their and Well, their the nuances products. of how I work. I mean, so that person understands how I work and my workflows and they're ahead of things faster than I can be ahead of things, right? I get a phone call and she's typing me all the information on my little, uh, you know, chat screen. And so by the time I even get the phone call answered, she's got all the information of what I, she already knows I need uh, yeah. up on my screen. And so there's nuances by having someone long, a long term there with you that make it, uh, make it worth that extra time and yeah, money. Definitely worth it. I think, I think like I said, you just got to show some commitment. It doesn't have to be, you know, all the way there. But if you're, if those who are listening, if you're struggling because that intern just went back to school and quit, right? And I got to get another intern because I can't afford. Well, I think, I think you can't afford to keep doing this right. on the cheap. At some point you have exactly. to commit to some people so that they can commit back to you and you can build a true team. And, you know, let me actually just pause here, too, because you were talking about the hierarchy, the breakdown of the um, or structure of your company, that you have those that are salespeople who earn money, you know, go find the clients and things, and you're in that group. Right. And then you have your account managers who are like the ones who own the client, you know, portfolio or whatever it is for each client. And then you have the customer service representatives who kind of take care of just all the busy work type Correct. pieces to assist them. And so when somebody feels like they can't hire somebody, in your opinion, you know, getting those people below so that you can focus your time and effort on finding new clients. That's right. That's yeah. where the money comes in. That's where the money, and that's where you really see your, your, your company growth, right? Um, you get to a point where before you're hiring people, you're trying to do all those jobs and you can't grow anymore. You've reached a limit. And by, able, by being able to get these people put in place, you're able to focus on that growth and it really makes that growth come exponentially once you get the right people in, in place on that. And I, I would say that. living at that limit is miserable. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah. It's usually it's a hard limit to be it's at. It's usually not a real good, profitable place to be. You're not really flying high enough above the ground to avoid those occasional crash months. Mm -hmm. And those crash months come because you have nobody to take care of the the busy work, the the, yeah. the business so you can prospect, right? It's just a, it's a horrible lifestyle. I, I, I probably spent 15 years <laughs> on that personal limit of what I could do all by myself, never trusting the team members that I had. And um, so just I, I just want to encourage anybody who's living at that limit to really consider. It, it, the minute I hired a person who could take over the loans that were locked for me and I trusted her, it was like it was like yeah. taking the, the lid off the top of the jar and there's just so much more business to be had that I was missing because I just didn't have the time to do any more business. Mm -hmm. That makes a big difference for sure. I want to, if I can, I want to go back just briefly, and I don't, know, but I want to go back briefly talking about the employee benefits for just a second, right. if Please that's do. okay. Um, I want to mention that there's a lot of gratification um, as a business owner to be able to provide those those benefits to an employee. Um, that gratification makes a lot of it worth it too because they really are making, well, my, like in the case of my employees, they make me look a lot better than I really am. <laughs> they do so much. They really have earned the ability to have those benefits. And so there's a lot of gratification in being able to say, we're going to provide this for you um, because they do so much for the company. Um, and like I said, they make us look so much better than we really are. And so... For anyone who, who does listen to this, is it, a, is it a leap of faith? Is it a leap of money? It is. Um, and when you're able to get there, I mean, you got to make sure you're financially stable to do it. But push yourself because it's worth it, because the employees do and know and recognize that as the benefit. And it really binds that loyalty to you. And I think that's why, to your case, that we've had so little turnover um, out of the last 20 years of a business. So, Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great story. Well, are you ready for our fire round for our rapid fire questions? <laughs> yeah, Kyle? let's do it. We'll wrap it up with these are uh, questions we ask every guest and we want you to answer them in one minute or less. Oh, I'll, cry. I'll okay? be fast. All right. Um, what is your favorite podcast? Besides ours, of course. Yeah. Well, well uh, since you put that caveat, I was going to say that, but with that caveat, I will say uh, increase your impact by, uh, with Justin Sua. Justin Sua. Yeah, awesome. It's just very short podcast. Um, daily things, but it's super powerful and I really like it. Cool. I'll check it out. What's your favorite business book? Um, there's lots. Um, I'm going to say like 21 Irrefutable um, 
Laws, 21 irrefutable laws, laws of leadership. leadship. John C. Maxwell. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I have that. I've, I've like read 12. John Maxwell. Yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's a good book. How many hours a day do you work? Uh, about six to 10. Okay. How many day. hours a day do you want to work? Right now, six to 10, because I love what I do. I like doing what I do. So right now, I do want to work six to 10 hours. 10, 12 years from now, two to five. What do you, uh, who do you really look up to in the business world as a role model and why? Uh, this is a loaded question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with someone that maybe a lot of people don't know, but um, it, probably my brother. Um, he really is the epitome of an entrepreneur. Um, he started many businesses. Um, he's seen the height of success in his businesses, and he's lost his businesses and had to do bankruptcy. Um, and he, so he right now does have a very, very successful business. Um, he's built an amazing team. And I run things by him all the time. He is a great, great leader, a great business mind, and he would probably be uh, probably the business leader I would look up to most. Uh, what is the one best piece of advice you can share with our audience? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it in two, and I apologize. But I'm going to say do what you love and love what you do. Um, because if, you're, if you hate what you do every day, you're going to do something wrong. You've got to love what you're doing. Um, that's the first thing of advice. My second one is to be kind. There's a lot of um, opportunity in this world for us to not be kind. And I think one of the greatest things in my life that has allowed me and my business to grow is simply being kind to people I run into every day. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, I would say that level of commitment you have to your business, being, being there six to 10 hours a day and being kind and committed, it really is paying off for you. I think your people can tell. I think the employees and your customers. Thank you. Well, I look up to both of you immensely as watching you. I knew you both before you both started your brokerage <laughs> and had true. used your services yeah. before you started your brokerage. And to see where you guys have come in the short period of time in the teams that you have built, I can see why you have this podcast to build teams because you guys are living what you're preaching and are, are building that. And so I hope the listeners to your podcast really understand the influence that you guys have on everyone's life that you're affiliated with. So I look up to you guys immensely as well. Thank you. Well, how can our listeners find you and get a hold of you? And uh, Best way, you know, our website, www.bondagency.com. There is no D in Bond. A lot of people say we're James, like James Bond. We're not. You're like Bond, bond Marche. Yeah, exactly. It's like old school, exactly. B-O-N, agency.com. Uh, and then our phone number is on there as well, 801-773-7570. Um, I'm not really active on personal social media. I have them, but I don't really participate in them. Uh, but uh, and then we do have some social media sites on there on Facebook and, uh, and stuff for our, our businesses out there. So, Well, I couldn't speak highly enough of your service as an insurance agent, especially uh, you do some of the stuff for my business, all the commercial stuff for my he business. He does all the commercial stuff for my yeah. business. And uh, just have really appreciated your expertise and service. And so I could highly recommend you if somebody's looking for a good business consultant and, in, and a risk advisor, mm -hmm. I think uh, they couldn't do better than to hire you. Thank you. That means a lot coming yeah. from you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, guys. Thank you.